So my name is Ima Sumac Marañón Davis. Uh, Ima Sumac is a little bit different. It's Quechua Indian. My father is uh, indigenous from Bolivia and my mother is from New England. Um, her ancestors came at the time of the pilgrims um, from I Ireland and Great Britain. Um, so with those kind of diverse backgrounds, um, I have um, grown up thinking about culture, right? Because I have two very like strong cultures um, kind of present within me. And as an educator, um, when I think about cultures, I often think of um, learning cultures. And when I think of learning cultures, I don't think of learning cultures as just in the classroom. Um, we have learning cultures at home, we have learning cultures in our communities, and one of the questions we should be asking ourselves is, um, what are the conditions of our learning cultures and what do they allow students to bring? So in other words, if I want um, an innovative learning culture, then the quality of my learning culture should have curiosity as part of its um, condition, right? So, I, so when I think of learning cultures, I think of how do you set the conditions that allow for students to come in with their gifts and show up? Right? Um, so in thinking about learning cultures, of course, um, I also think of equity and I think of uh, social justice because um, unfortunately, historically, we have not treated all people as equal. And because of that, there's a lot of historical damage that shows up today. And so when I think of um, how do we kind of begin to address this conversation in the classroom or even in um, diverse settings like organizations or in libraries or even among friends, um, one of the things that I always think of is alternative narratives. So we have a dominant narrative that is told, right? And that's the t story that is told about the history of whichever community you're from. That's the dominant narrative, whether it's from this country in the United States, whether you're from um, another country, you have a dominant narrative. But always there are alternative narratives. Other experiences that have been, um, people are having that are not from that dominant culture. And so um, in the United States in particular, we have a dominant narrative that creates what um, is called the myth of meritocracy, right? It's this idea that if you just work hard enough, then you will be successful, right? And, and so of course, this, this uh, myth, um, everyone comes to this country for, and, and then finds out that in reality, it's only for a few um, people uh, that this is really uh, given to. And one of the ways that we see this show up historically is through um, what's called the land rush. In this case, it was in 1889 and 1890, um, the Oklahoma land rush was a land rush that was created um, in order to um, uh, allow people um, to settle land that um, originally um, belonged to indigenous people. Um, now, they, they call this Oklahoma land rush um, any able-bodied um, head of household can come and just stake a piece of land and it's theirs for free, right? Um, but of course, if you know in 1889 or 1890 in the United States what was happening, um, the uh, last of the um, indigenous people of the Plains um, uh, tribes, so like Lakota Sioux, for example, were being cleared off the land and put on reservations. And this land that they traditionally had roamed freely um, was now being given freely uh, to only one group. And I say one group because when you think of 1889 and 1890, who was available to stake land? Um, it wasn't going to be the African-American community that were just coming out of slavery, um, the indigenous people we already talked about, and it's not going to be the Latinos because they were also losing their land. Um, and the Chinese immigrants were only allowed to come and work on railroads. So we have this, um, this land given away freely right, to really only one group, um, which is the white um, Americans. And so um, when we talk about meritocracy, um, we know traditionally that this is not true, that, that historically um, a lot of privilege was given to certain groups, right? Now the question is, why does this matter today? Why do we care? Um, when I think of the myth of meritocracy, I think of the level of stability that this free land gave to the descendants of those who were able to participate in this land rush. It gave them um, their family stability, um, it gave them psychological stability, and it also gave them land wealth, which shows up today in our um, society with those who um, own land and who have wealth versus those communities 
who have continuously had to struggle with one level of oppression or other. Um, that's one way to bring in the narrative, uh, alternative narratives into the classroom to challenge the myth of meritocracy.